Hey doctor, now it's time to wake up and pay attention. You're the doctor of the hour today, and you start to hear the sounds of the sirens arriving at the hospital. The waiting room is crowded with happy patients like every day on your routine. You have four different patients presenting with cough, fever, and shortness of breath. After exam your patients, you have decided to include COVID-19 on your differentials, then you ask a chest CT for all of them. But there's no radiologist today in the hospital to help you. Now you remember the times you tried to read a CT scan by yourself, and you tried to contact other doctors to help you, but they are too busy or they don't know how to answer your questions. And the question is, do you know which one of these patients has COVID-19? I'm pretty sure that in the final of this series of lectures, you'll be confident to say if these patients have typical findings, indeterminate findings, or atypical findings. Let's learn together now. This is Doctorius, and my name is Lee. This is the first part of our series of lectures about COVID-19. In this lecture, we are going to present some basic concepts to understand chest CT scan, and I made lots of animations to make it easier for you to understand those concepts. If you want to learn more about radiology in an easy way, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Let's go there. This is SARS-CoV-2. This is an acronym for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. The term corona means crown in Latin. This name was given to this family of viruses because their surface looked like a crown. The number 2 was given because it is genetically similar to the virus SARS-CoV that emerged in 2002. And the second one, the SARS-CoV-2, has emerged in 2019. The name of the disease caused by this virus is Coronavirus Disease 2019, or simply COVID-19. When someone infected with COVID-19 talks, cough, or sneeze, droplets carrying the virus travels through the air and may get into your mouth and nose and then going down to land into your lungs. It will follow a long road through the airways passing all the way through the trachea, and then it will pass through the main bronchus, segmental bronchus, subsegmental bronchus, the terminal bronchial, respiratory bronchial, and finally in the alveolar saccus. At the end of this road, we find this structure called the acinus. The acinus is also called the primary pulmonary lobule, and they are usually described as ranging from 6 to 10 mm in diameter. Let's detail you the anatomy of the acinus. This is the terminal bronchial. The terminal bronchial is not part of the acinus, but it serves as a landmark for its definition. An acinus is anatomically defined as a long portion distal to a terminal bronchial and it is the largest parenchymal structure in which all airway units participate in the gas exchange. Let's move to the next page to meet the real acinar structures. This is the respiratory bronchioles. This is the first part of the acinus and the first part of the lung to present alveolated walls. These are the alveolar ducts. These are the alveolar sacs. These are the cavities inside the alveolus, and these pores are the internal communication between the alveolus. And now, I have one question for you. Have you ever seen a nastiness on a CT scan? Maybe that's because this is a microscopic structure. On regular CT scans, we cannot see the asini. Now, we have to say sorry. Maybe we went too deep, and now we have to give a step back. Next, I'll put a slide on our microscope and I'll zoom out to see the surface of a real lung. In the real lung, there are these polyhedral structures that are like boxes full of acini. These boxes measure from 1 to 2.5 cm in diameter and it contains from 3 to 24 acini. Right, let's move on to focus in one of these boxes of acini. These boxes are called lobules. Actually, they are called the secondary pulmonary lobules because the primary pulmonary lobules are the acini. 
Nevertheless, the secondary pulmonary lobules are more important to us than the primary ones. These white walls, or septa, divided in these boxes, are called the interlobular septa. Now, I'll give an advice to you. Before learning chest CT scan, you should learn what's inside these boxes. You really can't understand the findings and imaging studies without the knowledge of the secondary pulmonary lobule. The secondary pulmonary lobule is the fundamental unit of lung structure and it reproduces the lung in miniature, airways, pulmonary arteries, veins, lymphatics and the lung interstitium are all represented at the level of the secondary pulmonary lobule. That's why we are going to construct this secondary pulmonary lobule together. The oxygenated blood that comes from the right ventricle goes all the way through the pulmonary arteries and this arteria to this secondary pulmonary lobules. It will give several tiny ramus to the acinus as you can see in this figure right now. We will need our microscope to zoom in and go deeper in this concept. This is the acinar level. Going deeper, we are going to see the alveolus. At the level of the alveolus, there will be the hematosis. Hematosis is a process that consists of gas exchange between the pulmonary alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries that envelop them. Gases move passively by diffusion across a surface, moving from the more concentrated region to the less concentrated region. All the blood returning from the body tissues to the right side of the heart now come deoxygenated and full of CO2 to the alveolus. CO2 goes out from the capillaries to get into the alveolus. This CO2 will be released from the body when you breathe out in the expiration. On the other side, when you breathe in, the O2 will get into the alveoli. The inspiration will make the O2 concentration in the alveoli be greater than the concentration on the capillaries, and the O2 by diffusion will get into the venue capillaries, turning the pulmonary venues oxygenated. These venues will get out of the acinus and they will go to the periphery of the secondary pulmonary lobule. These venues will fill the secondary pulmonary veins that are located in the periphery of the SPL. Now that the blood is renewed and oxygenated, it will get back to the left heart by the pulmonary veins. Then, the blood will be pumped through the aorta to get to the rest of the body. The structures that go in the middle of the secondary pulmonary lobule are called centrilobular. That is the case of the pulmonary arterioles and bronchioles, but is also the case of the lymphatic vessels. This structure will give several ramus and it will return by the periphery of the SPL along the interlobular septa, just besides the pulmonary veins. These structures on this region will be called the perilobular structures. Now it's time to give you an example of how important is the understanding of the SPL to read a chest CT scan, X-rays or even chest ultrasounds. This patient doesn't have a normal heart. Look the wall thickening, indicating that this heart is tired and it isn't pumping the blood out properly. This patient has heart failure. The consequence would be that the blood will take the wrong direction, going back to the lungs by the pulmonary veins. There will be a congestion of the pulmonary veins. And now this patient presents a congestive heart failure. When this blood gets back to the lung, leading to a congestion of the peripheral veins of the SPL, we will have a condition called cardiogenic pulmonary edema. This condition is subdivided into two phases. The first one is the interstitial edema, and the second one is the alveolar edema. Because these veins are in the periphery of the SPL, we are going to see it like an interlobular septal thickening, but not only in one, you should see it in lots of these secondary pulmonary lobules. On chest x-rays, this interlobular septal thickening will be represented by the curly B lines in the periphery of the lungs, demonstrated by these red lines. These B lines in the periphery of the lungs are well defined in the ultrasound as well. They are delimited by these white asterisks. 
If you trace a line at this level and make exo slices on a CT scan, you should see the interlobular septa thickening like that. To sum up, the main finding in the first phase of the cardiogenic pulmonary edema, called interstitial edema, will be the interlobular septa thickening. But there is another interstitial finding that could be present as well. To understand that, we have to pick up our microscope and go deep again. The blood that returns to the SPL peripheral veins will get to these small venues. The increased pressure in these venues can cause extravasating blood to this interstitial between the acinus. In this case, we will have an intralobular septa thickening. The intralobular septa, demonstrated by this brown background, are delicate strands of connective tissues separating adjacent pulmonary acini. This scheme will sum up our findings. This is the interlobular septa thickening, the main finding in interstitial pulmonary edema. The interstitial inside the lobule is obviously called intralobular, but as this interstitial is also between the acini, we can call it interacinar as well. This second yellow arrow is showing us an intralobular septa thickening or interacinar septa thickening. In this example, we can see the interlobular septa thickening and now the intralobular septa thickening together. This is another representation of the first phase of the cardiogenic pulmonary edema, also called the interstitial phase. In this real patient, we can see intralobular septal thickening and intralobular septal thickening. Then we have to come back to our scheme to understand the second phase or the alveolar phase. Now we have to pick up our microscope again to zoom in and go deeper again to reach the level of the alveolus. Note the background. Now we have an intralobular septal thickening. The hydrostatic pressure will increase and the blood will return to the microscopic levels of the lung, leading to a congestion of these tiny capillaries. At a certain level of hydrostatic pressure, there will be fluid spilling into the alveolar cavities, fulfilling these cavities. This phenomenon will occur diffusely on every single alveolus of the SPL. Remember that there are alveolar pores communicating these alveoli and this content should pass to the neighbor alveolus of the same acini. These areas will be represented like ill-defined areas on the CT scan. These areas are called ground glass opacities. Ground glass opacities, or GGO, is a descriptive term referring to an area of increased attenuation in the lung CT scan with preserved bronchial and vascular markings. That is the second phase of the cardiogenic pulmonary edema called alveolar edema. This is a patient with a smooth thickening of the interlobular septa, consistent with interstitial pulmonary edema, but there is also alveolar opacities in the central peribronchovascular distribution, classic of alveolar acute pulmonary edema. This distribution of pulmonary edema is called batwing edema. Now, you got to remember that the SPL is a 3D structure. It should be kept in mind that the size, shape and appearance of the secondary lobules as seen on CT scans are affected by their orientation relative to the scan plane. Like I said before, the structures that are in periphery of the SPL are called perilobular. There are many causes for the perilobular diseases and they are subdivided in smooth interlobular septal thickening nodular interlobular septal thickening, irregular interlobular septal thickening, and peripheral lobular abnormalities. The objective of our class is not to discuss each one of these diseases. Maybe in the future we can dedicate a lecture only to talk about the secondary pulmonary lobby. The structures in the center of the SPL can be seen as a dot depending on the slice you get on the CT scan. The structures that are in the center of the lobule are obviously called centrilobular. On CT scans, a linear, branching or dot-like opacity seen in the center of a lobule or within one centimeter of the pleural surface represents the 
intralobular artery branch or its divisions. The visibility of the bronchial in healthy subjects depends on the wall thickness of the bronchial rather than its diameter. There are many causes for the centrilobular diseases. They are subdivided in bronchiolar infection, bronchiolar inflammation, and the bronchial spread of a tumor, angiocentric disease, and perilymphatic disease. Remember that the lymphatics goes in the perilobular septa, but they stand in the centrilobular space as well. And now, I'm sure you're confident to say which one of these patients has a typical findings for COVID-19. I'll give you some seconds to think about the answer and how to describe the findings. Meanwhile, I'll talk about our next episode. On the next episode on Doctorius, we're going to talk specifically about the COVID-19. If you like the video, give a thumbs up to support our channel to make more videos like that. We're just beginning our channel, now I want to hear from you. What do you think about this kind of lecture? Do you think the animations made it easier for you to understand the concepts? Leave your comment below. Now we're going to answer the question. Following the recommendation of the Radiological Society of North America and using the knowledge we've learned, we should classify the first patient with the typical findings, because he has cardiogenic pulmonary edema represented by interlobular septal thickening, minimal GGO, but he has pleural effusion as well. This is an atypical appearance for COVID-19. In another video, we're going to talk about the recommendations to the reports of COVID-19. Before you go, I want to ask you a question. Do you think we have another patient with the typical findings for COVID-19? Leave your comments below. This is Dr. Arias and my name is Lee.